We're continuing our series in the book of Acts. We're almost at the end of this marvelous historical account of the early church. This account written by St. Luke, who also wrote, wrote the book of Luke. And um, let me repeat. Uh, the book of Acts is the uh, second volume of a two-volume set that St. Luke wrote. The set circulated in the early church as one book called Luke-Acts, Luke-Acts. Then later, uh, at one of the early count church councils uh, that set the order of the canon, or the Bible as we know it, they um, divided the books and they put the book of Luke uh, in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then they put Acts after John and before uh, the book of Romans. So in verse chapter 27, is, which is uh, where I'd like to direct your attention to this afternoon, the unfortunate circumstances of chapter 27 find the Apostle Paul as a political prisoner on the way to Rome uh, to defend his case for Christ before Caesar himself. And that's where we find the Apostle Paul en route on a ship. On a ship in the middle of the Mediterranean. On a ship in a hurricane. A ship in a hurricane for 14 days. Um, the Apostle Paul endured uh, this uh, great catastrophe. Um, and so let's begin to read the word of the Lord, chapter 27, verse 1. And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus's band. And entering into his ship, of Adramitium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coasts of Asia, now modern Turkey. One Aristarchus, a Macedonian, who was with Paul, one of his disciples, one of the leaders at the Church of Macedonia and of Thessalonica, was with us. And the next day we touched at Zidon, and Julius the centurion courteously treated Paul and gave him liberty to... Um, have some shore leave with his friends to refresh himself. And when we launched from there, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. Okay? Now let's, let's skip down to verse uh, 10. Is everybody there? And, and, and Paul said uh, to the uh, captain of the ship, to the Roman centurion Julius, and to the owner of the ship, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the uh, cargo, but also of the ship, and also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed that the master, believed the master and the owner of the ship, more than those things which were spoken by the Apostle Paul. Is everybody listening? So the Apostle Paul had a word from the Lord. And the word from the Lord was that we should um, stay in safe harbor at a place called Fair Havens, which was in the Lee of Cyprus. Which is a wonder, wonderful uh, sheltered harbor from the north winds that blow from the North Pole through Europe, all the way down through the Mediterranean Sea to the Middle East. So this, this, this northeasterly that they call, this wind, this nor northeasterly, blowing down from the Arctic Circle through Europe, through the Mediterranean, uh, would hit the island of Crete. But underneath that island was a little harbor called Fair Havens that would protect them from the onslaught of this Hurricane wind called in Greek Euroclidon. Euroclidon. 
Eurocliden. You hear the word Euro, which means Europe, from Europe, and Cledon, which means hurricane force wind, from where we get the word hurricane, from the word Eurocliden. Is everybody listening? The word hurricane comes from the word Eurocliden, which is a northwest easterly that comes blowing down from the Arctic, through, cuts through Europe, cuts through the Mediterranean Sea, um, at, at winter time. So it, it, these, these storms begin in the Mediterranean at winter time. So winter time is a very difficult time for ship travel in this big ocean. Is everybody listening? Especially in the days when the ships had sails and masts and um, when the ships, ships were made out of wood and, um, and, and when they had to, uh, when they had to uh, raise the sails or lower the sails and they had to tack with the wind. Um, these ships were big, big ships. Don't get me wrong. These ships were huge. Some of them as l big and as uh, uh, large as uh, container ships or ocean liners. They were making them um, uh, years before um, the birth of Christ. Um, there were ships, let me tell you, there were ships the size of Mission Ebenezer from one end to the other. The naval ships that they used during the First, Second, and Third Punic Wars, uh, uh, in those great wars between Carthage and Rome, the naval battles were uh, naval battles of a uh, humongous proportion. The ship that Paul was on itself carried 276 people. That's a lot of people in one ship. Well, these ships were massive, and as you look on the side, you'll see to the right of the ships, these were... Uh, um, uh, camphora, amphora they were called, amphora, and these vases contained olive oil, uh, they contained wheat, barley, flax, um, and they filled the holes of these ships with uh, these amphora, uh, maybe thousands of them, and this particular ship, we'll read on, Paul changes ships and gets on a ship much like that, that we're going to read about right now, okay, is everybody there? Okay. Uh, verse 14, uh, not long after uh, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Euroclinon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. Okay, now this is after Paul had changed the, from one ship. Uh, he changed to another ship as this ship is moving along the coast of the Mediterranean on the southern part all the way around jumping from port to port and then sailing back down under Crete and then cutting up uh, to the safe side of Italy by Sicily and then up there into uh, the coast off of Rome. Very likely landing uh, at Ostia, which at that time was a very large man-made uh, maritime port at Ostia. Now that's just ruins. Um, okay, pastor's been there. It was my great privilege um, after graduating from Harvard University to be selected by the American Summer Institute of Rome. And so pastor has this strange title called Fellow of the American Institute of Rome. I even had an audience with the Pope. Did you know that? Me and 10,000 others. So, you know, we had a good time. We had a good time. But um, they, they choose different people for different reasons. And they chose me. And Rita and I went for free. And for us, it was just a vacation. And we had a good time. But anyway, so that's, that's neither here nor there. Other than that, we went to Rome. And we visited the place where the Apostle Paul probably uh, went to the Roman Supreme Court of the land, which was to speak to Caesar which was his desire. Do you remember that up to now we've studied that the Apostle Paul was in prison in Caesarea for two years. First under Felix, uh, and then under Festus, and then uh, he appealed uh, to Caesar for fear that the Jews would kill him there and he wouldn't be able to fulfill his lifelong dream was to be able to preach the gospel to the highest forum in the land. And that was to speak to Caesar. And, and you know, the, 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 wonderful, the wonderful occasion, I'm getting ahead of the story, but we read in Philippians, in the first, second chapter of Philippians, that the gospel was, had reached Caesar's palace as Paul was in house arrest. One, uh, one, one praetorian guard 
after another elite Praetorian guard was giving his heart to Christ, since he was chained to Paul's wrist and chained to Paul's ankles, he was forced for 24 hours to listen to Paul sing and praise the Lord and lift up the name of Jesus. So that one after another of the elite, and as Pastor Joe called them this morning, the Navy SEALs of, uh, of Caesar. You know, as we read in verse 1 right there, it says that Paul and certain other prisoners uh, unto one named uh, Julius, a centurion of the Augustus band. Does everybody see the word Augustan band? The Caesar's name was Augustus. That's like President Obama in that time. Is everybody listening? Pay attention. His name was, the Caesar name was Augustus. So Julius was sent from Palestine, part of the elite private guard of the Caesar himself. In other words, these guys were either Navy SEALs or Green Beret, but they were elite Praetorian guards. Isn't that interesting that the Lord surrounded Paul both in Philippi, uh, in Rome, when he was in Rome, writing to the Philippians, and on his way to Rome to meet Caesar with the best of the best. And they were giving their hearts to Jesus Christ like popcorn. So in other words, he was a powerful witness of the grace of God. You and I want to be powerful witnesses of what God has done in our life with our friends that need hope, with people that are drifting, with people that are anchorless in life that have no clue about what life brings its way, no clue what direction that should take. Those are the people that God has called you and I to give meaning to. And if you're not doing it, you're wasting your friggin' time as a Christian. You're wasting your time. I told you last week, if you're not sharing what God has done for you, how he changed you, how he saved you, how he took your sins and washed them away, how he gave us brand new hope, if that isn't thrilling to you to share with some girl that's got an abortion or some man that's a pervert or someone that's a drug addict or someone that's an alcoholic that needs help, if you can't say something to someone, if you can't breathe wind in someone's sails, if you can't give someone a helping hand, then by golly, you have no right to be a Christian. You're wasting your time and my time and God's time. I'm serious about this. Man, I just blessed this morning. I wouldn't say it unless pastor was crazy for God. Bless this morning to see a family of the people that are working remodeling my home after 40 years. Pastor's remodeling his home. 66 years old, and I'm not downsizing, I'm upsizing, man. I'm not moving to a condo. Praise God. We're in the fourth quarter. And we're winning 27 to nothing. And we're not going to stop on God unless God says so. Is anybody talk, listening to me? I don't care if you're in high school or wherever you are, college, at work. Be alert to that girl. Be alert to that boy. Be alert to your friend and by your locker. Be alert to that little girl that's so confused because her grandfather's molesting her. Be alert to that boy that's getting into a gang and starting to take crystal meth, and, and what used to be a straight-A student is becoming a, a blithering fool. The bane of America. Is everybody listening to me? I mean, that's the way Paul was. See, I am, you know, and I was talking to this guy that's coming to do the demo at my house, and I was drilling him about Jesus. He, had, he took four days, you know, he took four days, and, and guess what? Him, his wife, and his two boys have been coming to church for the last two months in the Spanish service. And they gave their heart to Christ. Amen. Amen. And then one of the painters, man, he was in there. He, I don't know what was going on in his life, but he looked like he was in a hurricane. And we, I said, look, let's just stop painting right now. I got to go to work at the church. But let's stop painting right now. And let's have a word of prayer, all in Spanish. And, and, and I told him, man, you're going to give your heart to Christ. You need Christ, don't you? He said, si, senor. 
Oh, and he put his hand right here to my hand, and we made a little painting circle, and he gave his heart to Jesus. His name is Martin. He start, you know, when you give Jesus a, 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 an opportunity in your life, it starts coming out of your eyes. You start to cry. If you give your heart to Jesus and you're not crying, I, don't, I doubt it. I doubt that you did. If I don't see it coming out of your eyes, nothing's happening. You must be going to church for another reason. When the Holy Spirit gets a hold of your heart and starts to squeeze on it, the only way that that water comes out is through your eyes. Otherwise, I don't even know why you come to church. Well, let's see. Keep coming. Something good's got to come of it. Amen. Nothing bad can come of it. I heard of people that just come here and when they leave, they're inspired. They want to go out and kick the devil's rear end. You know, they want to go out and ask for a promotion. You know, that's what happens here. People, people just get uplifted by the word of God. And so here's Apostle Paul in the midst of this uh, thing. But not long after, okay, uh, there arose, there arose, okay, against, it, against the ship. The second ship. Now they're on the second ship because they left the first one. And they caught another one, in Ale Ale uh, an Alexandrian ship out of, uh, I think it was out of uh, Sidon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. Is everybody listening to that? We, they let the ship drive. Who was driving the ship in that storm? Nobody. Nobody. You know what I mean? This ship was tossed about by the wind. But there was somebody behind Paul who wasn't even the captain of the ship. He wasn't even the owner of the ship. He didn't know diddly squat about ships. The only thing he knew was to trust in God. Follow me? The only thing he knew was to put his trust in God. So in other words, this storm was so bad. This hurricane was so bad that the captain had to tell the helmsman, pull up the anchors and let her drift. So the ship was at the mercy of the Euroclidon, tossed about by 35 foot waves. Tossed about to and fro like flotsam and jetsam. And they couldn't do anything about it. Which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship. I don't even know how they did that. I didn't know they had, say, uh, divers then. But I wouldn't pass the fact that they had some contractions under the ship to tie ropes from one side to the other. To keep the planks together of this great vessel. So in, in, in my own imagination. All I can go back to Alexander the Great. And his assault, of, his assault of Tyre. When Alexander had maybe a thousand divers. That dove under the water. With goat skin stomachs. Breathing in and out of these goat skin stomachs. Until they arrived under Tyre. Through their sewer system. Came up inside. This is. Three centuries before Christ came up inside of Tyre and burned it to the ground. So in other words, they had, dive, they, they had divers. So I, I'm thinking that maybe they dove under somehow, uh, but they went under to, to tie the planks together. Fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands and they struck sail. In other words, they had to drop their sails. So this ship was just drifting at the mercy of the hurricane. Aimlessly, without direction, the compass would not help because of the cloud pack. It said, and, and we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. Now, you know, this ship, it said, was a merchant ship taking wheat in amphoras from Alexandria, Egypt. And it was the last wheat of the harvest because it's getting to winter time. Is everybody listening to me? 
It's the last wheat of the harvest. In other words, this is, this is, this is, this is that, that owner's entire life is on that ship. That's how he makes his money. Pay attention to what I'm talking about. Everybody listening? This is his livelihood. This is the last harvest that he's taking to Rome. That's how he's going to get paid. So to him, money's more important. The ship's more important. The cargo's more important. The stuff is more important than anybody else on the boat. He could care less about Paul. That's dead weight. He's lucky they didn't throw him over with his disciples. Because this merchant man, all he cared about was what? Finance. But I want to tell you something. Don't put your hope, don't put your trust, don't put your heart, don't put your focus on money or finances or stuff or material things. I'm telling you what, financial loss can be spiritual gain. When it seems like you don't have what you need, you're in the right place. You need God. When it seems like all is lost, when it seems like your life is drifting, when it seems like you don't know where you're headed, when you can't see the sun because of the hurricane over you for 14 days, when you're depressed and want to hide your head under your pillow and you don't want to come out because you just heard that you have cancer or someone in your family has cancer or somebody died somewhere where you can't go see them or when you just lost your job or when you had five interviews and every interview has, has come back empty. When it seems like you don't know what to do or where to go, you're in a good place. You're in the best place you could be. Because you can't be confident in things. Because God is bringing you to the point where you need to be confident in him. And there's no better place to be than the place where you're forced to trust in God. People telling God to take this away, you're asking him prematurely. God may want that for you. So that you could turn toward him. Because... Okay, let's face it. You know, when there's no storms in life, you know, when there's no adverse conditions in life, you know, when there's no tempest in life, you know, when there's no hurricanes blowing through your marriage, you know, when nothing like that is going through in your life, pay attention to me. When everything's going good, that's when we start drifting from God. Right. Call me a liar. Right? But let me take you back to that storm that you were in 10 years ago. Let me take you back to that storm that just hit you. Let me take you back to that illness that put you up in that hospital. Let me tell, take you back to the day that, that you learned that you were pregnant and you're only 17 years old. And now you got to tell your mom. And now you got to tell your dad. And now the whole family is going to know. And, and your Auntie Edna, she got a big mouth. <laughs> let me take you back. Let me take you back to the day that, that your wife said bye-bye. Uh, let me take you back to the day that your husband said bye-bye. Let me take you back to the day that, you, that your kid wrapped an SUV around a tree. All right? How close were we to God then? And then now look at us now. Look at us now. Everything's going fine. I don't know why you're coming to church. I haven't seen some of you for a long time, and all of a sudden you showed up. And I'm saying, well, praise God. It's a good place to be. Amen. You couldn't be in a better place. But pastor's trying to remind us today, if you ain't seen a storm yet, one's coming. One's coming. That's life. It's not God. God doesn't want storms for us. God is good. But life ain't fair. Huh? God is good, but life ain't fair. The Bible says we got ourselves into this mess. But here's Paul. Is everybody listening to me right now? Okay. He said, let her drive. You know what that means? Let the boat drift. Pull up the anchor and let the boat drift. 
Maybe your life is drifting. Maybe you're drifting out there somewhere where when you're coming to church because maybe this is a last resort, a last gasp effort to stay alive. And your life is drifting. You're drifting inside. You're aimless. You're like a shark with no rest. Nobody knows where sharks come from. Nobody's ever seen where they go to rest. Nobody has ever in the history of marine science ever seen a shark have a baby or sharks mate. What is that? Who knows? Who knows? But maybe you're like a shark. You're coming to church and maybe it's good that you're here listening to the gospel, but you're drifting. You're drifting. And you need to find fair haven. That fair haven is Jesus Christ. It says in the third day, we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. Notice what they're doing. They're throwing everything out but the money. Well, that's the problem with us. We get rid of everything first, but, and we get rid of Jesus too. But don't get rid of my money. You know what? There comes a point in time in your life where money ain't going to mean a thing. Stuff is not going to, your house is not going to mean a thing. I always say this. There can become a point in time where some other guy is going to be driving your car. There's going to keep coming a point, and let me tell you what, pastor's talking here, saying the truth. There'll be a point in time where you wish you could buy another day like Henry Ford, the man that made the Ford. When he was on his deathbed, he said, I'll give a million dollars to the doctor that can give me until tomorrow to get things straight. He died without his wish, man. Your career, your dream, your money, your stuff, your popularity, making the right connections, getting into the right network, all of that amounts. Are you paying attention? To a hill of beans. If your life is not straight with God, that when we need to trust God. Look at this, verse 20. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope was lost. Perhaps all hope is lost for you. Perhaps you think all hope is lost. There's people that think that all hope is lost. They're in such a difficult situation that they cannot even pray. It's just praying feels like 2,000 pounds to get out of your heart. That's how life gets so tough sometimes. You can't even pray. You can't even, it's, it's, I'm not saying that you don't want to. I'm not saying you're rebellious. I'm just saying that it's not, no, it's your desire, but you just can't. You're in a situation where you can't pray. You're in a situation where you're trying to encourage someone and, and you say, man, trust in God. And they say, it's easy for you to say. It's easy for you to say. I say, you know what? I wish I could say whatever it would be to take you out of your funk. The only thing I can say is that trust in the Lord and I'm going to stay here today with you for a couple of hours until you start feeling a little bit better. Because it don't, it don't help for me to just to say I'm praying for you and then I walk away from you. Don't ever tell somebody you're praying for them and then walk away. They come up to you and say, oh, I'm going through a hard time. I say, I'm praying for you. <laughs> Lord, I feel a healing coming on you. I'll see you the next week. I don't do that. That's not Jesus. Right? You have to stay. Paul the Apostle, he stayed right there with this boat. Look at verse 21. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs. You know, this word abstinence, I don't know what it means, Joe. I don't know if the word abstinence means that after a long time of not eating or after a long time of not saying anything. How many have been with someone and, and you want to say something, but you said, man, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. But then you can't stand it. And you said, oh, forget it. You know what? I've been dying to tell you. You know, so I, I think Paul was abstaining from both, from food and from saying. Finally, he stood up and he said, I tried to tell you 10 days ago to stop the ship at the Fair Havens. But nah, you guys was looking forward to that little bar down there in Phoenix. 
And now look where we're at. Everybody follow me? Look, here's the Apostle Paul. Look at him. Look at him. Look at him. But after a long, okay, now here, here. Is everybody paying attention to me? Here is a storm. Here is all hope lost. Here is 276 people drifting. Drifting in the middle of a sea. You know, look at that. Would you like to be on that? Now, I know you'd rather be at in and out right now. Well, all you're going to get is a little bread and some juice right now. You have to set, you're going to be your, your beloved Eucharistical appetizer. That's where he's at. That's what's happening. Tossed about. Aimless, hopeless, drifting with no anchors. See, if they drop the anchors, the anchors would tear the boat off. Is everybody listening to me? Now look, look. If I was on that ship, you know where I would be? I would be in the hold of the ship, in a corner, under a bunk bed, with a puke bail. Puking my guts out. Joe talked about that this morning on a little fishing trip that he took that was perfectly unsuccessful. After a long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of him and he said this. Listen to Paul. Listen to him shouting against the wind. Is everybody with me there? His voice needs to be heard above the wind. And here is a man that does not know anything about ships. Does not know anything about navigation. He's not Philip the navigator. Here is the man that has no rational understanding about how to sail. Here is a man that knows nothing about where this ship is going, how it's going to get there, how to fix this storm. Because not only the captain, but Julius the centurion and the 100 Roman elite that were with him were cowering on the deck or in the hold. Nobody knew what to do. They were at their wit's end. In other words, there comes points in life when you and I cannot figure out what's going on with our own mind because there's nothing we can do to change that situation. It's out of your hands and it's out of mine. Your reason at that point cannot help you through that thing. Your intelligence will not help you. Your college will not help you. Your upbringing, your education is useless. The human reason has come to a dead stop. And whenever our mind and our reason and our intelligence comes to a dead stop, there is right there the importance of recognizing that I can't do nothing about it. And if I can't, and I'm a believer, I know that God can. Amen. That is no longer human reason. Oh, that is no longer, that is called faith. Faith kicks in. Where the reason can't go. When you're at the end of your rope, God's at the beginning of his resources. When you come to the end of your strength, then God begins his strength. When you can't do it, God can. When you're not able, the Lord is able and capable of doing whatever it is that he needs. Watch this. Not to help you. <laughs> God's concern is not to help you primarily. God's main concern is that his will will be done for you. I don't know if you understood that. I don't know, I, I don't know if the non-clappers understood that. Oh, help me, Lord. Yeah, if it's in his will for you, to achieve his further end. Pay attention. If it's his will for you to achieve his further purpose, then he will help you. No harm in asking. No harm in asking. You need to ask. But God has a perfect will for each one of you. And God's will for Paul was that he would speak to Caesar. So God's will for Paul to speak to Caesar was more important than losing wheat, than losing amphoras full of olive oil, 
than losing the boat. And those captains, those centurions had to come to that recognition. Is everybody following me so far? Okay. And now I exhort you. Look at Paul. Wow. <laughs> Man. Okay, but after long absence, Paul stood forth. Watch this. What did Paul do? They hadn't eaten. They were so scared. They were so mindlessly afraid that they hadn't eaten. They couldn't eat. How could you eat if you barf it up? They hadn't eaten for 14 days. And all of a sudden, Paul said, I'm sick and tired of this mess. I'm about to stand up here. Let me tell you what. A believer stands up in a sit-down world. Everybody say that. Stand up in a sit-down world. When everything is falling apart around you, a person of faith will stand up and say, okay, everybody just chill. Okay? God's in charge of this. Hey, hey, honey, chill. God's in charge. You know what I'm talking about? Mijo, mijo, hey, can you hold on there for a minute? Just stop crying for a second. Why? God's in charge. You know, so in other words, Paul's doing, he stood up right now in the middle of a storm. A, a believer stands up in the midst of the storms of life. And he said, sir, you should have listened to me. Don't you hate it when someone say that? You know, how many of you remember when you used to get in trouble with your mom and dad? And you come home, you know, you messed up and you come back and I told you so. Yes. Ah, come on, mom, I told you. Well, mom, look, you know, I told you. Blah, blah, blah. Now watch this. And now Paul said this. I encourage you to be of good cheer. Now how can anybody be a good cheer in the middle of a problem? Right? That's easier said than done. Right? Easier said than done. But it bears to be said. Just because someone in trouble tells you, uh, easy for you to say, don't stop saying it. Keep on saying, trust in God, honey. I'm right here to help you. Paul says, be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any, of any man's life among you, but of the ship. Only the ship is going to be lost. Only the stuff that doesn't matter. Give us this day our daily bread, not our daily Mercedes. Although, it doesn't, it's not bad driving. But don't make it the focus of your life. Our daily bread, our basics. That's what God likes. And Paul said... Everybody listen. This ship's going to be lost. Mr. Owner, your ship's going to be lost, but you're going to live. Mr. Captain, you still got a job, but he's got to buy another ship. Mr. Centurion, you're taking me to Rome. For there stood by me this night the angel of the Lord, whose I am and whom I serve. And he said this, Paul, don't be afraid because you must appear before Caesar. Because God has given you all the people that you're sailing with. And not one of those 276 lives will be lost. You should clap right there. Mom and dad. Your daughter, your son might be errant, drifting, broke up, anchorless, shiftless, without a job. Under tremendous tempestuous strain. Mister, you might not know what direction to head in. You may have been fired. Lady, you may just have heard that you have cancer. But I want to say something to you today. The angel of the Lord has stood by me and has said to me, you're going to be all right. 